So once that chemical binds to the taste bud, there are two things that it can do. Number one, it can bind to a receptor, and that receptor can depolarize a neuron directly. So essentially, that chemical is going to bind to a neuron. And when that happens, it's going to allow sodium to get in. It's going to cause a local depolarization, which can then cause an action potential. If we don't depolarize the cell directly, in other cases, we will activate a second messenger system that, like we've seen before. And so it's going to turn on one protein, which is then going to turn on another, which will turn on something that will allow the sodium in. And so imagine we have a membrane. So our little chemical is going to come on and bind here. This is going to activate that receptor, which will activate another protein, which will activate a pore that will allow sodium to come. So it can cause the depolarization directly or indirectly. But in either case, you're going to stimulate a dendrite, which is going to cause an action potential to fire through the neuron and eventually get back to the brain. Those neurons are going to get collected into the facial nerve, and that's going to send it, at least, sorry, the facial nerve is going to collect the information from the front two-thirds of the tongue, and the glossopharyngeal nerve is going to take the signal from the back one third. The vagus nerve is going to get the signals from all the taste buds that are not on the tongue. There aren't a whole lot of them, but there are some. And if anybody, if you start hiccuping, what have you ever tried? Stop yourself and hiccup. Hold your breath. Scare somebody. What was it? Belching. Belching? I've never heard that one. Sugar on your tongue. Sugar. And water. Or drinking water. Water. Upside down. Has anybody ever tried? Uh, but I've had the best luck with some, drinking something sour, like lemon juice. So hiccuping is a spasm of the diaphragm. Diaphragm is controlled, at least in part, by the vagus nerve. And so essentially that spasming is coming from bad signals going to the vagus nerve. And so if you can mess up and send a strong signal through these taste buds, you can kind of reset the vagus nerve sometimes. And so if you, at least for, my, for me, if I drink something like lemon juice, it basically takes over the vagus nerve and resets it and sometimes it'll stop it. Yeah, and then you, yeah. and it's not working. So that's taste. We're not, not going to go too much into taste. Next is smell, and the, the technical term for smell is olfaction. And so this is very, very similar to taste. It's just instead of touching it, a taste bud, we're going to have those chemicals touching the inside of our nose, and it's going to set off neurons in our nose. And so if you remember from the lab, at the top of the nasal cavity, we have the olfactory mucosa. And in that mucosa, there are a whole bunch of olfactory cells, which are neurons. And then along with that, there's going to be some epithelial <coughs> supporting cells, and then basal stem cells. So the epithelial supporting cells are going to be more or less the structure of this area. The basal stem cells are going to be able to form more of these epithelial cells. And so but what really does the work here are the olfactory cells, which are the neurons. And so we're going to have parts of these neurons sticking down actually into the nasal cavity. So that's going to allow things that we smell, this molecule, to come up in here and bind to those neurons and create an action potential.
So at the basal end of each of these cells, so the basal end is towards the surface, towards the, the basement membrane. So the apical surface is going to be down in this case. The apical surface will be this way. The basal surface will be this way. And so the basal end of each of these neurons is the axon. Those axons from multiple neurons get collected together into a fascicle. They go through a hole in the bone, cranial cavity, and then all those fascicles come together, and those fascicles are the cranial nerve number one. So we have our nasal cavity down here with the things that we're smelling. We have neurons here with the dendrites down here. So the, the body of the neurons are right in the mucosa. And then the axons come up, and then they get bundled and bundled and bundled, and they turn into the cranial nerve one. This is going to be a second messenger system. When we breathe it in and we smell something, it's not going to depolarize the neuron directly. It's going to use a second messenger system and create cyclic AMP. When we create cyclic AMP, we're going to allow in sodium and calcium. When you do that, you depolarize your neuron, you create your action potential. That action potential is going to go into the brain. Now, people like to say one of our senses is most closely linked to memory. What do people like to say? Smell. It's smell. Why do you think that is based on what we just learned? Like You're always smelling things. But, so, if we go back to the picture here, we have a neuron here. The dendrites are going to detect the smell. It's then going to send the signal through the axon up here. Where does that axon end up? The brain. And so essentially, it's a direct line straight from our nose to our brain. It doesn't have to go through any kind of networks to get there. And so it's the direct link to our brain, and so we really notice smells. And so we really get a good signal from them that helps us to remember them. Okay, so that's smell. I'm not gonna go too much into those either. So just like in lab, we're gonna spend most of our time on the eye in the ear. So it's important to keep in mind what vision is. We have a general idea, and immediately we have an idea of what vision is. But what really what vision is, is sensors in our eye detecting light bouncing off of things. Right? Light comes from a light source, whether it's a light bulb or the sun or fire or whatever, and then it's going to bounce off something else and then go into our eye. So our eye is going to say nothing more than, I detected this wavelength of light in this direction. And then it's up to our brain to actually put together our version of what is consciously around us. So there are a bunch of accessory structures around our eye, and most of which we learn in the lab. And so number one, we have the eyebrows, which do a couple things. One, it helps to express things non-verbally. It also protects our eyes from glare. If you squint, you kind of bring your eyebrows down. And it also helps protect our eyes from some, some sweat. Foreheads get really sweaty, and so the eyebrow kind of acts as a little natural sweat band, right? <laughs> so there you go. After eyebrows are the eyelids, which are also called palpebra. And so these have some obvious function. It's going to block things from getting into our eyes. It's going to help block light from getting to our eyes to help us sleep. It's going to help spread tears over our eyes to keep them moist. At the corners of our eye 
uh, we have the commissures, and so there's the lateral and medial commissures. Which one is this one? Lateral, because it's on the outside. There are tarsal glands that are going to secrete some oil, and so if we just had straight tears, tears are made of mostly water. Water likes to evaporate. And so there are tarsal glands which are going to secrete some oil that's going to help prevent that. Then we also have eyelashes that kind of keep debris out of our eye. If you're like me, all they do is rub on sunglasses when you put on sunglasses, and they get really annoying. So basically, all of those accessory structures are on here. There's a few things we didn't talk about. You're only responsible for the ones that we did talk about. There's also the conjunctiva. We talked about the conjunctiva in the lab. It's kind of a, a membrane that covers the front of the eyeball and then the inside of the eyelid. And then there's also orbital fat. If you, when you dissected the sheep eyeball, there was a bunch of fat on there, right? That's there for a purpose. Number one is to cushion the eye. And so if we get hit in the eye, it can kind of move around. It also allows it to move around in place and not rub against anything too hard. There's also going to be a lot of blood vessels and nerves going to our eye. And so they need to be in something soft. Otherwise, they can get pinched. And, and when the eye is moving, it can pinch these blood vessels and nerves. So they're going to run through that fat, and that fat is going to be a protector for us. The tears, we, we learned, were made by the lacrimal gland. So the lacrimal gland is above and on the, the lateral side of your eye. The tears are made up here, and then gravity can kind of pull them down onto your eye. By blinking, it spreads it over your eye, which helps bring the tears over to the medial corner. And then when we get over here, the tears can go through the, the lacrimal canuliculus. There are two of them here that then drain into the lacrimal sac, which drains down to the nasal lacrimal duct into the nasal cavity and out the nostrils. That's why if you start crying, your nose starts running. It's not snot, it's tears. <laughs> it can flush snot out with it, but snot really has nothing to do with crying. Right? There are also muscles on the outside of our eye that help to turn the eyeball and help us look in different directions. So these are extrinsic muscles. There are also intrinsic muscles inside of our eye that fine tune the, the focus and things like that. But extrinsic muscles are just going to turn the eyeball. And so there are three cranial nerves that help to control that. I wouldn't worry too much about which muscles are controlled by which cranial nerve, but I would know that these three cranial nerves control the extrinsic muscles of the eye. So then moving inside, we have three main parts that we can break this down. There are the, out, the outside kind of structural parts of our eye. There's the optical components, which are going to focus the light. And then there's the neural components which are going to receive the light and send the signal to the brain. And so on the outside, we had three layers. And those three layers are going to be called the tunics. And so there are three tunics, tunica fibrosa, tunica vasculosa, and the tunica interna. So coming back up to the fibrosa, this is the sclera and the cornea. So remember the sclera, is the white part of your eye. The cornea is the clear part right in the center. The sclera and the cornea are kind of right in line with each other. But just obviously, right in the center, it has to be clear to let the light through. And so the 
Fibrosa is the outermost layer. Unless you're right in the middle, where the, where the cornea is, you're going to be the sclera. Moving down below that is the tunica vasculosa, which includes the choroid the and the ciliary body and the iris. So in lab, we learned, if you can picture the diagram, there were three layers in the back. There was the sclera, the choroid, and the retina. And so sclera, choroid, and then retina is going to be down here. But in terms of the eyeball in the front and the back, there are other things that are included in these layers. So the ciliary body is going to support the lens and iris. It's also going to secrete the aqueous humor. Where is the aqueous humor? Inside the eyeball? Inside the eyeball. <laughs> where? In, you, you, just in general. In the body. It's like in the front. front or back? Front. Front. Aqueous humor is in the front around the lens. And so it, that's secreted by the ciliary body. Then the iris is, um, we all know the iris, the colored part of your eye is going to open and close to change the size of the pupil to change the amount of light that gets through. And then the, the in, innermost layer is a tunica interna, which is primarily the retina, but also is going to include in the very, very back of your eye the beginning of the optic nerve. So remember, the retina is essentially a continuation of the optic nerve. The optic nerve comes in the back of your eyeball and then spreads out and forms the retina in the back. So the tunica interna is the retina and then the first little bit of the optic nerve there. So that, is, that was the structural parts, and then we'll move on to the parts that really focus the light. And so the first thing the light's going to hit is the cornea. Behind the cornea is going to be the aqueous humor. Aqueous humor is this, uh, the, the fluid that the lens is located in. So you go through that, then you're going to hit the lens. So let me We've got the corn, it's going to hit the cornea. The lens is going to be back here, but that's the aqueous humor. Now I'm doubting my ability to talk. Still missing. We're going to go through the cornea, through the aqueous humor, into the lens, and the lens is suspended by ligaments. And so that lens is just kind of hanging there, and that allows us to pull it different directions and change its shape. The lens is a fluid-filled sac. Think of a clear water balloon. It's around to start, but if you grab it and you pull it, it likes to flatten up. So depending on how much you pull it, you're going to change how much it flattens, and you're going to change the focus of the light going through it. So now we've gone through those. Now we're back in here into the big open part of the eye. What is the big open part called? Vitreous body, which is full of vitreous humor. Very humorous, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> so the purpose of the lens is to focus light on one part of our retina. We want all of that light hitting that spot. What is that spot called? Yeah. There was a little dot. Something sin the centra mm -hmm. no. 
Oh, we have some traumas. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh. Totally bad memory, right? Yeah. Fovea centralis. That is the center of your focus. Okay. So light that comes in directly doesn't have to be bent. It's going to hit there automatically. The light that does not come in right to the center has to be bent so that it hits in that spot. So the cornea is going to do a lot of that. But the lens is going to do the fine focusing. Think about our, our microscopes. I told you when you focus, when you first put it on, you have to do the, the coarse focus, get it kind of in the right ballpark, and then you can use the fine focus to get it perfect. So your cornea is bent. It's going to bend the light. And so it's hard to see it on, on this diagram, but these lines do in fact start to bend when they hit the cornea. And then they hit, hit the lens, and the lens can do the fine tuning. If we want to see far, we're going to let the lens become more round. And so do you think the tendons are going to tighten or loosen to make it more round? They're, they're going to loosen. And, and so it's going to let the top and bottom of the lens come back, and so it's going to get more spherical shape. So if we need to look at something that is near, our eyes have to do a lot. There's a lot of things that are going to have to happen for us to see near that we don't have to do to see far. The ability to see far is called emotropia. So if we're looking at something more than about 20 feet away, our eyes don't have to work all that much. Because for the most part, the light rays coming in are coming in straight. So if I look at that doorknob over there, in terms of my range of my range of vision, it's just a tiny little part of my vision is coming from that doorknob. And so they're all pretty much coming straight into my eye. If I come right up to the doorknob and stick my face right up to it, anybody open it? If I put my face right up to it, I have doorknob all the way up to here. And so I have light from that doorknob coming from a very wide range of angles. And all of that light is going to have to get focused on the one spot in the back of my eyeball. So it's going to take a lot of work. And so there's going to be two things. We're going to have convergence of the eye. We'll see what that means. Constriction of the pupil, so our pupils are actually going to get smaller when we look at something that's up close, and then the lens is going to flatten. So this is emetropia. We're looking at something a long ways away. Our eyes are just going to look straight. But if we look at something that's close to our head, we're going to get convergent. Our eyes are actually going to turn in. Our lens is also going to change shape. And so here, in emotropia, that's far vision, it's basically pulled flat. It's pulled flat, so it's thin. Our, our eyes are dilated. They're big. We're going to be able to allow in a lot of light from coming from a wide range of angles because more or less, in the end, they're not coming from that far away from each other. For near vision, our pupils are going to constrict, they're going to get very small, and then the lens is going to get thicker. A thicker lens, a more round lens, is going to bend the light more. Think of it this way. If you pull that lens as thin as possible, it's basically like a window. It's basically just flat. And when the light goes through a glass window, it doesn't bend. It just goes straight through. If it goes through something round, it gets bent. So we need to bend all of this light. Okay. Now the light has gone through our lens, it's gone, th gone through the vitreous body, and now it's going to hit our retina. So the retina is going to take that light energy. Light is energy, 
and it's going to convert that energy into an action potential. So the retina itself has a couple different parts. There's what's called the pigment epithelium, and then there's the part that is really the neuron and the functional part. So the pigment epithelium is in the very back of the retina. Its purpose is to absorb extra light, and so that way the image that we're looking at is not going to get distorted by stray light. Okay? So we're going to be able to see, say, we're only going to acknowledge light that's coming straight into our eye. Any extra light that comes in at extreme angles and starts bouncing around is not going to hit the retina correctly and it's going to get absorbed by the pigment epithelium. So then also on the retina are the photoreceptor cells. These are the rods and the cones. They are cells. So they're going to absorb the light, generate the chemical response, which is going to lead to the action potential that goes to our brain to create an image. So there's the photoreceptor cells. They're going to start the signal. It's going to, they're going to pass that signal on to the bipolar cells. And then the bipolar cells are just going to be a middleman to pass the signal on to the ganglion cells, which are extra other neurons with a very long axon that will send the signal to the brain. So rods and cones, all they do is they, they receive the light, start the signal, but they're not very long. But pass the signal on to bipolar cells, which just act as a bridge between the rods and cones and the ganglion cells. <coughs> the rod cells are going to be night vision in black and white. Cone cells are color in bright light. So they're called rods and cones because at the very top of them, the rod looks like a rod, the cone looks like a cone. So those ganglion cells, the things that are actually going to receive the signal from the bipolar cells, they have axons, they're going to come together, and they're going to form the optic nerve. And so we have two eyes, right? And so we're going to have two nerves coming out of them, one from each eye. And so those two optic nerves are going to come together in the center of our head to form the optic chiasm. And then this is where it gets a little crazy. If you can't figure this out, don't worry about it. I don't think it's going to be a big deal. It, how our brain is going to take this information and create our sense of awareness of the environment around us. Okay? So half of the light from my left eye is going to go to my left, left half of my brain. Half of it is going to go to my right. Half of the signal from my right eye is going to go to the left, half to my right. The right cerebral hemisphere, so this side here, sees things on the left because when they come from the left, they end up on the right back side of my eye. Is that, can you picture that? So something on my left is going to come in, it's going to enter my pupil, and then cross the midline of my eye and end up in the back part of my eye towards my nose. Something coming from the right is going to go through my pupil and end up in the back left corner of my eye. And so things on the left end up on the right hand side of my eye, which goes to the right side of my brain, which controls what side of my body? My left. So if something is coming at me from the left, I need to respond with my left side. If all of a sudden a squirrel jumped out of the ceiling at me, I need to swat it with my left hand. But that's going to happen from the right side of my brain. And so when I see the squirrel coming from that way, it's going to hit the right side of my left eye, cause my right side of my brain to cause my left hand to swat it out of the air. And it's going to be awesome because I'm going to have it on video. I'm going to become famous, and I'm going to buy a big boat. Okay. 
So we've got the optic tract, and so the optic chiasm, the two nerves, come together to form the optic chiasm, but then it has to split again because we have two halves of our brain. And so it's going to split into the optic tracts. Those tracts end up in the thalamus, which we know is a very, very highly important part of our brain that controls a lot of things, right? So that signal is going to end up in our thalamus. And then there are actually going to be other neurons that come from the thalamus that are then going to go into the cerebrum, which is where the primary visual cortex is. So if you can picture that diagram showing the visual processing centers, they were in the back, right? They were not in the thalamus. So it's going to come from my eyes into my thalamus. My thalamus can do some things at that point, but it's also then going to send the signal out of the back of my brain into the cerebrum. So this is where it's going to provide me that picture of what's around me, the conscious awareness of what's around me. My thalamus can do very quicker things like making me swamp the squirrel out of the air. I'm going to swamp the squirrel before I even really consciously am aware of the squirrel because I have squirrel-like reflexes. It's, it's swamp, right? So this is kind of a summary of what we just saw. So we have light coming in. And so light, something on my left, is going to come in and hit on the right hand side of that eyeball. These are going to come together and we're going to form the optic chiasm here. It's going to split into the tracks. It's going to go into the thalamus. And then from the thalamus, it's going to go all the way back into the occipital. That's the eye. Good on the eye? That's where you say, I, I, Captain. Every time I see that picture, it's like, it reminds me of the, the end boss from Star Fox 64. And anybody? Yeah, it's Andros, but the, the, the brain at the very, very end. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it reminds me. We got one Star Fox fan. Nobody else? Who's Star Fox 64? So there is the ear. Okay? So we know a lot about the ear. We're not going to go too much more in depth, but more than what we already covered in the lab. So we know that there's three parts. There's the outer, middle, and inner ear. And so outer and the middle ear, their only function is to get signal into the inner ear. So my question then is, why is the inner ear so far into our dang head? Why don't we just put the inner ear out here? Protection. Protection. Yeah. So that when you ignore the Q-tip box and you just jam it in there, <laughs> you don't ruin your cochlea. Okay? Because it says right on there, don't stick it in there. But have you ever known anyone who used a Q-tip in their for their ear without just sticking it in there. I mean, you're not going to wipe the outside of your ear. I mean, you're not going to buy a for that, right? So the inner ear is going to take the vibrations that come into our ear, convert them into action potentials that will then go into our brain and let us hear things. So inner, inner ear, there's two terms. Just, these are things that we're, you're actually familiar with. They're just not terms that we use in the lab. So we have the bony labyrinth, labyrinth and the membranous labyrinth. Just looking at that picture, what does that remind you of? What does it look like? Semicircular. The semicircular tracks. Okay. So the semicircular tracks are, in fact, these things. So the bony labyrinth is just the bone around them. Those semicircular tracks are actually embedded in a bone. And so in order for them to be embedded in a bone, you have to have these basically tunnels in the bone. 
And so the tunnel in the bone is called the bony labyrinth. Inside of those bones is a membrane. And so just line, lining the tunnels is the membranous labyrinth. And so then, then the semicircular canals are going to be within that membranous labyrinth. So here's our semicircular canals. Those are the ones in the lab. They're also pretty hard to get those. Well, I think I think I think the, the semicircular canals, the one the, 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 the model that I used on the practice exam, I think it said it was fake. The the, the middle ear bones were real, but they're just sitting there. So those are just plucked out. And so the labyrinth itself is going to be the semicircular canals, the semicircular dots. So you have the bony labyrinth, the membranous labyrinth, and then the labyrinth. And so not only is it the semicircular ducts, but it's also the vestibule, which is the saccule and the utricle. And do you remember what these do? What do the semicircular canals do? Not a good sign. E equilibrium and think balance, things like that. But there is a difference between what the semicircular canals do and what the saccular and utricle do. It's a, it's a slight difference, but it's definitely a difference. So if I tilt my head to the side, I can tell my head is tilted to the side. Which one of these is doing that, telling me that? We have utricle and the saccule together. Okay. So if sac sacral and utricle tell me my orientation, if I'm not moving, what do semicircular canals tell me? They tell me turns. If I'm turning, it's like that feeling of the G-force that's going to come from the semicircular canals. So in the inner ear, we have the labyrinth, which is the semicircular canals and the vestibule. And then we also have the cochlea, which is going to be here. And that's going to be the hearing. So our ears have two big functions. There's equilibrium and balance. And then there's also hearing. I think that's just like an extra enter or something. That's nothing. So in the cochlea, there are three chambers. Scala vestibuli, scala tympani, and scala media. And scala media contains a spiral organ, which is also called the organ of corti. And this is what's going to convert sound vibration into nerve impulses. We're not going to talk too much about these three chambers, but essentially the purpose of these is to get the sound into the organ of cordy. Okay? They're just kind of focusing sound and tuning sound. They don't really have too much of a functional purpose. The magic happens in the organ of cordy. Vibrations are going to go through the outer ear, the middle ear, part of the inner ear, just to get to that then that's going to send the signal to our brain. So in the spiral organ, or the organ of Corti, there's an epithelial layer that has hair cells in it. Okay? And a lot of people are probably, you probably know, your hearing is based on there's hairs in there that are going to vibrate. Okay? That's where these hairs are going to be. And there's actually a couple different types of hair that serve specialized purposes. There are inner hairs that actually vibrate and sense the hearing. They're going to send the signal to your brain. But there are actually a whole lot more hair cells that are going to sense what, what frequencies are coming into our ear. And it can actually tune the cochlea to better hear it. Okay. So then we can get better precision, 
sending signals to our brain. And so if you very first hear a sound, your ear is not tuned to it. And so the signal that your brain receives is kind of fuzzy. But if you there's a note that continues on and on, you can really focus on it, and your organ and your cochlea can adjust to it, focus on it, and then you get a really precise, clean signal going into your brain telling you what pitch it is you're hearing. So that's the hearing. Then there's the equilibrium. And so we said there was a semicircular canal, the semicircular ducts. That's angular acceleration. When you turn your car and you feel it turning. And then there is the saccule and the utricle, which are static equilibrium. And so me standing here and tilting my head, it's also going to tell me that braking and accelerating feeling. When you step on the gas or slam on the brake, you can feel that acceleration. That's the saccule in the utricle. The turning g-forces are the semicircular ducts. And so the saccule and utricle use a, a method of calcium carbonate crystals along with protein. And so I should have drawn. Imagine you have a dish, okay? Imagine you have a soup dish, right? So you have a soup dish, and you put a marble in the bottom of that dish, okay? Where is the marble going to sit? Assuming it can perfectly run. At the very bottom. It's going to sit right in the very bottom. Now, if I quickly move my hand forward, where in that bowl is the marble going to go immediately? To the back. Because the, the marble is going to try to not move, right? The dish is moving under the marble. And so the marble is going to hit the back wall of that dish. But if that back wall of that dish can sense that the marble is there, it can send a signal to the brain saying, well, the marble went back, and so we must have moved forward. If I take the dish and I pull it back quickly, the marble is going to hit the front of the dish. And so my brain can say, well, the marble hit the front of the dish. I must have moved backwards. It's also the same thing. What if I take the dish and I just tilt the dish? Now where's the marble? It's over on this side here. And so I know if the marble's over here, I must have tilted that way. If I tilt this way, it rolls over there. Same thing if I go like that. What's the difference between that and it rolls to the front, or if I go like that? What's, how's our brain going to know which one's which? How quickly it happens. Yeah. It's so how quickly it happens and how long it lasts, right? If I tilt my, my, hand, my head like that, it's going to stay that way. If I go like that, it's going to stay to the back. But if I quickly go like that, it's going to hit the back, and then it's going to fix itself. Right? So that's how the satrical and neutral, saccual and neutral work. There's these little granules that move around, and they sense where the granule is, and that tells you how your head is moving. Semicircular ducts or canals are the same idea, but instead of having granules, they just let water splash around. So now, imagine I have if you have, I have a water bottle. Somebody, yeah. So hold the water bottle up. You want me to do it? So I hold the water bottle like that, right? And if I quickly go like that, all the water rushed that way. If I go like this, all the water ends up over here. And so there are sensors all along this tube. And so it's actually going to sense the water moving to the left. It's not going to sense it hitting the left-hand side. There is no left-hand side. It's a circle. But it's going to sense the current moving through the canal. And all these canals are all oriented in different directions. Right? And so if I take this and I move it like that, I'm not going to have any current going this way. So that canal is not going to notice 
any change. But there's another, one of the other canals is oriented that way. And so now that one's going to notice it, right? And so how many, in three-dimensional space, how many directions are there? Three-dimensional space, how many directions are there? Three. That's what 3D means, three dimensions. Okay. <laughs> Wouldn't there be six, though, that be going one way and then the other way? Yeah, that's what I'm saying. I mean, the net just has two mm -hmm. directions. Right, right, right. So, but, so you've got x axis, y axis. Up, down, left, right. Yeah. So there's two axes, but then there's the z axis, which is in and out of the board. And so in math, we kind of draw it that way because we're drawing it on a two dimensional board. Yeah. But it's really coming in and out. So there are three dimensions, and there are three semicircular canals, right? One's for the x, one's for the y, one's for the z. But each one can go in positive and negative directions. And so. This one can twist that way, or it can twist that way. This one can go this way or that way. This one, I don't know which, which one did I, that way and that way. Whichever way I didn't do the other one. Right? So you can see, you can detect three different axes. And when you move kind of, I mean, we don't normally move right on an axis. We're going to move somewhat. But so we're going to get senses from two different, two or three of the different canals. All those signals are going to go to our brain, and our brain's going to come together and say, if these are the signals I'm receiving, I must have moved in this direction. Okay, so now, going back to the cochlea. You have to get these signals from the cochlea into our brain. So at the base of the hair cells, these vibrations are going to hit the hair, and the hair is going to vibrate. When the hairs vibrate, it's going to cause a depolarization of neurons at the base of that hair. And so the base of those, the neurons base of the hair have an axon that leads from the cochlea into the cochlear nerve, which joins with the vestibular nerve to form the vestibular cochlear nerve, which is cranial nerve 8. So each ear is going to send signal to both sides of the pons, and then they're going to end in the cochlear nuclei. Then from the cochlear nuclei, we're going to have the signal going into the inferior colliculi of the midbrain. Midbrain. Don't worry about the inferior colliculi part. It's going to go to the midbrain next. So that's going to do some of the fast response things with hearing. So one is going to help us figure out what direction it's coming from. So I know which way do I need to turn in order to figure out what's going on. This is going to process change in pitch. This is what's going to make us get startled. So when there's a big boom and you kind of jump, that is the, co the cochlear nucleus sending signals into the midbrain. The midbrain is going to control that startle response and make you turn your head towards the sound. So that's going to be the fast response. But then it's also going to send signals into the thalamus. And then the thalamus is going to send the signals to the auditory cortex and the temporal lobe, which is going to allow us to create that, again, conscious idea of the sounds around us. So when you hear the boom, you jump, and then you say, oh, that wasn't something worth jumping about. Because there's that slight delay because it has to get from the midbrain into the, the upper part of your brain in order to create that idea. So we have the cochlea here, and then we have the equilibrium sensors here. And so they're going to come together form cranial nerve 8, which is going to come into the cochlear nucleus. It's going to come from the cochlear nucleus up here into the blue olivary 
nucleus, which we didn't even talk about. Then it's going to come up here into the inferior colliculus, which was located to what part of the brain? Midbrain. The midbrain. And then it will come up here into the thalamus. And then the thalamus will send it over here into the primary auditory cortex. So there's a bunch of steps here. Okay? But really, the most important one are the midbrain and the auditory cortex. And that's the end. So what were odds? Or, never mind, I just gave the answer. No, you didn't. Yes, I did. Why? How about this? Which cells are not getting much sensory information from this screen? Cones. The cones. Why? Because it's black and white. The cones. And if when, not yet, but when you go home and you eat ice cream to celebrate your fantastic score on the exam, what what sense is going to get stimulated? Not. Obviously, taste, but uh, what's the technical term for taste? Gustatory. Gustatory. 